This is just intended to be a very quick uh, survey, um, certainly not covering all aspects of Vancouver's architecture, and it's uh, a very, very large topic, so bear with me as we, as we move forward. This is actually a photograph from uh, Queen Charlotte Island, Skidigat in 1878, showing that there was actually a very sophisticated uh, local architecture here before the European settlers. Actually, they were quite startled to see the kinds and the size of the buildings that the First Nations were building um, here. This, this contact period resulted in a lot of disruption and dislocation, which I won't go into, but certainly brought a European sensibility in terms of how there was a response to the local context and mo most specifically the use of wood because that was so readily available in this part of the world. But interestingly, the buildings often brought, again, that European sensibility, in this case, an almost Georgian revival style to the structure, the symmetry, the regular bays, hipped roof form. So we see that being brought, being imported into this part of the world. There wasn't a lot of settlement here until the gold rushes really began um, to bring a lot more people in, which prompted, of course, the Royal Engineers to be sent over to bring law and order to this part of the world leading to the establishment of settlements, most specifically New Westminster, our first city in, in Western Canada in 1860. Uh, also, uh, Hudson's Bay Company played a very crucial role in the settlement of the province, including uh, first agricultural settlement, uh, Craigflower Farm. Again, we see the buildings that people were building at this point in the 1860s reflected their European sens sensibilities, in this case, again, the Georgian Revival style in a slightly more sophisticated way. The Gothic Revival style was also seen in this, uh, this time uh, often for churches. Italianate style uh, was the other major style in the 1860s for houses, as well as the, the residential version of the Gothic Revival. This is uh, Irving House in New Westminster, which is our oldest house museum in the province. 1865. In Victoria, we see Angela College being built again in the 1860s. Sophisticated use of masonry starting to now come in uh, into the picture. Local brickworks as well as imported bricks coming in. Uh, the 1860s gold rush was what kicked off a lot of this settlement. Uh, you can see they rather conveniently painted the gold, the gold fields in gold here. Uh, so you could see where, where um, the miners were coming in, and it's, in, it's really hard to convey how uh, phenomenal an impact this had on, on various cities. In 1871, uh, there was a promise of a transcontinental railway, which began this whole move towards tying BC to the rest of the country, which at that point between BC and, and um, Ontario was completely unorganized territory. Uh, with that move to join Confederation at that early date, federal government became involved in designing buildings on the West Coast, uh, one of which survives as the Customs Building in Victoria. Again, a masonry building, but a very much um, more simplified version of what was being built back east. In the 1860s, we see Commercial Row in Victoria start to develop along the waterfront. Things changed, however, very, very dramatically for Vancouver when it was announced that Vancouver would be the terminus of the Transcontinental Railway. And to Victoria's great disappointment, there would not be an extension by bridge or barge to Victoria as part of the system. The CPR really made the city, as William uh, Van Horn so famously said, we can't take the scenery to the tourists, so we'll have to bring the tourists to the scenery. So not only was the CPR leading to settlement throughout Western Canada, but it set up a network of, of tourism, of supply, uh, and also set up Vancouver really as the point of transshipment across the Pacific. But um, uh, two months after the city incorporated and before the arrival of the railway, uh, the Great Fire caused uh, basically the city to burn to the ground. This is the telegram from Mayor McLean to Prime Minister uh, John A. Macdonald, our city in ashes, 3,000 homeless, asking for help. The city was basically devastated but rebuilt extremely quickly in anticipation of the arrival of the railway. This 1880 shot from Gastown really tells the story. Some small, modest, two-story masonry buildings, smaller wood frame buildings clustered along the waterfront. Uh, the working harbor and the, the railroad really being the, 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 the genesis of the city. 
virtually nothing on the North Shore except for a couple of large sawmills. The rebuilding was almost immediate. The ashes were barely cool before they were already digging foundations for new buildings like the Alhambra Hotel at the corner of um, uh, on Water Street at Carroll uh, and a cluster of buildings there started going up within months. Uh, materials would have had to have been barged in, uh, the bricks and, and metal for, would have been barged in uh, probably from Gulf Islands, from Victoria, um, because there were no local brickworks on the mainland at that point. But you can see the strategic position of Vancouver here, the, the red dot on what was called the all red line through, through British properties to Asia. The key thing of course being this was the point of transshipment. Your goods are coming from Asia and, and coming on onto the land or coming by land and going out by boat. So it's a very, very strategic position that Vancouver is in. Uh, here's the original city. Here's old Granville Town site, which is now what we call Gastown, the birthplace of the city. But you can see how it was gridded out in a fairly regular grid by the CPR. Uh, CPR was the largest landholder in the city. They were given 6,000 acres in exchange for bringing the railway um, from Port Moody to Coal Harbor. It was a bit of a shell game at the time. Uh, they didn't really, they were going to do it anyway, but they were given a very generous subsidy to do that and ended up uh, developing most of uh, the west side of the city, <coughs> Shaughnessy, Kitsilino, um, and Marathon. Realty is still a very large player in Vancouver's real estate game. This is a bit of a gag set up picture from what we can tell, but uh, the, the history of Vancouver is actually the history of speculative development. Many of, the, uh, many of the large landholders, like J.W. Horn, um, built many, many buildings. And, and it was often, um, when we see later as the suburbs in Vancouver developed, we'd see large landholders uh, building large tracts of housing, um, which were then snapped up by people who were moving into the city during the great boom periods. So the history of Vancouver really is one of boom and bust, as is the history of the province. There were a number of, of successive waves of development that, that drove the city's economy and were, were manifested in the physical environment of the city. And this ties then very closely to the architectural expression that we see. So we now start to see successive waves of building in the city. After the railway, the next wave of building um, was the Klondike era, 1897, 98, 99. Like the railway, uh, the Klondike was a bit of a, a bust locally. Up country, there'd been a mining boom. The price of silver had gone up in the 1890s. Towns like Nelson, Rossland, uh, Greenwood were incorporated under something called the Speedy Incorporation Act of 1897. Uh, and there, so there was this boom going on up country as silver prices went up. And we see that manifested in the buildings of the time, a really, uh, in this case, unusual Catholic church up in uh, Nelson. Uh, Church of the uh, Mary Immaculate, which uh, and I'll talk a little bit later about the introduction of the classical revival styles right at the uh, turn of the 19th century. It's actually built in wood. The gold fields up in the Yukon um, uh, started to be, uh, the information that there was gold up there started leaking out in 1896. By 1897 there was this startling rush starting up there and the um, in fear of what had happened of, in the 1860s, the authorities really clamped down and said, if you're coming into this area, you need to bring a year's supply of food and everything that you need because otherwise you'll just die by the side of the trail. So uh, the, uh, the number of the Klondikers coming in were being outfitted in Victoria, in Vancouver, and then coming up the coast with all their supplies. So it became really important to supply these people and that became uh, a great generator of, of activity in Vancouver. This is what Hastings Street looked like in 1898. This is Hastings, this is where the Dominion Building sits now. Victory Square is across the way. Uh, you can imagine that if 18, the 1890s had not been a boom period in Vancouver. The, as, I, as I mentioned, the railway had been a real bust. So this was one of the buildings, Jonathan Rogers' first building, um, built in 1894, expanded in 1898. He was apparently one of the only people willing to stay in town and actually build at that time. The building is still there. Um, but Hastings Street became the main thoroughfare 
upon which the Klondike era buildings were built. So by the 18, late 1890s, 1898, 99, we begin to see building up on both sides of the street here. 